special meeting of the Strasburg Board of Education is called to order at 7.29 p.m. on February 16th, 2022. This meeting has been called to allow uh, the administration and our Strasburg Public Schools head nurse the opportunity to present the board with information regarding COVID-19 and the mask mandate and to allow the board uh, some time to, to uh, question and answer session with them and also to allow the public an opportunity to speak to the board regarding their feelings. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Sunday to begin his presentation. All right, good evening to uh, members of the Stratford Board of Education, good evening to my colleagues, and good evening to our families who are here and those who are at home. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief presentation uh, based on the governor's announcement and maybe discuss and hear from our stakeholders their dispositions on uh, the governor's announcement. So, so go ahead and click to the next slide. So early February, the governor uh, announced that in collaboration with DPH and CSDE that he was going to release local control to local boards of education regarding the mask requirements. You know, the irony in this is that we have been in this pandemic for more than two and a half years. And to me, this signals uh, some positive light because we know what the pandemic has done to children from an academic standpoint, from a social emotional standpoint, but we still have to face the fact that we're still in a pandemic. Um, overnight, we had a lot of people, teachers, administrators, educators all across the country who had to become uh, epidemiologists. You had to learn how to quarantine, and for large part, that's something you've seen in movies. And they don't learn how to contact trace. So today, what you will see is a presentation that captures all the voices of our stakeholders. I have to give a special thank you to uh, Kim Velasquez and the Borges. Uh, we sent out a survey. We had more than 2,000 responses from our families. We also did some internal work to get a survey from all of our colleagues in our professional community. So you'll see me present that data today. Um, I do have to say, I'm not sure all of our families are aware of this. I do know there's activity on social media, but we receive your emails, we receive those phone calls, and we do read them, okay? We don't just discard them, we read them. Your voice is going to be a key variable in informing how we make decisions for our 6,800 of our students and our over 1,000 members of our professional community. On Valentine's Day, uh, the General Assembly extended and it was voted into law uh, the very next day. So I will ask uh, my colleague to go ahead and advance to the next slide. We engaged in the process where I asked a series of our leaders to talk to the colleagues and really kind of get a sense of where they're at in terms of uh, the governor's announcement. So these are seven stakeholder groups that we had the chance to survey. We made a very simple survey. I think that data is interesting, and I think the data that we have is going to provide good conversation for the board as we unpack this. So I'm going to start with our secretaries. Okay, we asked our secretaries, these are the first people you see when you're walking into the building. Let's go ahead and click to the next slide. Give you all about five or six seconds to take a look at that pie chart. So you'll see. Um, that is pretty balanced across the pie chart. About 32% are in favor of the mask mandate. About 42 would like us to lift it. And about 25% report that they're indifferent. Again, uh, overall pretty good response rate uh, across every one of these stakeholders. Let's go to the next slide, which is our CIAs, our paraeducators. 105 responses. We have about 45% who report that they want to keep the mask, about 40 who want to lift it and go to mask choice, and about 15 who are indifferent. I should note that a healthy population of this stakeholder group right here are front facing with children. They actively work with children uh, in close proximity. Uh, slide, go to the next slide, please. And this is a group that keeps our building functioning and all of our kids in a safe space to access our education. We had about 39 responses, 
about 85% of them want to remove masks. We have 13 who are indifferent, and we have about 2% who about two percent who want to keep the mask. Let's go to our next group, our nurses. About 43% want to go to mass choice. Another 43% indifferent, and 14 want to keep the mask. Our faculty, our certified staff, um, everybody who's doing this work is characterized as a hero, but in my work and traveling through our schools, this is a group that every day continues to outstand me. We had 459 responses. That's probably closer to about 85 or 90 percent of our overall staff. 42 percent report that they would want the mask in place, approximately 42 percent. About 46 percent want to lift it, and about 12 were indifferent. Next slide. We have about 39 responses from our district administrators. Those are principals, coordinators, assistant principals, department supervisors. And again, you'll see the chart is pretty balanced. About 41% want to lift the mask, about 31% want to keep it, and about 28% are indifferent. And this is a pretty, the next slide illustrates a pretty important stakeholder group. And I'm sharing this data because uh, transparency is a critical piece and that family engagement piece is critical to the work that we do for our children. So I think it's very important to have this data publicly viewed by our, our families and anybody who has a vested interest in the Stratford Public Schools. You'll see that in our town, we've had about a little, a little bit over 2,000 submissions. And I, I believe Ms. Velasquez has updated data on that, maybe another 100 or so submissions. This pie chart looks quite similar to the ones that you saw before. About 47% are in favor of keeping the mask, 43% lifting it, and 8% are indifferent. Very useful data, okay? Um, I do want to note that we have a law in place, so by and large, the mask mandate has not been left to municipalities, and we will have the, the opportunity to make, a, uh, to, excuse me, to make a decision that's unique and specific for Stratford beginning on the 28th of February. Let's go to the next slide. I wanted to give you some trend data, and these numbers might have shifted since uh, we last drew on these numbers. You'll see a little bit more detailed numbers on that when uh, Ms. Velasquez presents. As of February 8th, these are our vaccination rates for each band of our students. We are happy that our vaccination rates for our eligible uh, 12 through 17 kids have gone up. So essentially, uh, seven out of every 10 children report that they're vaccinated. But our numbers are still quite low for our little ones. Let's go to the final slide. So as we continue to have conversations about this, these are some of the considerations that I do believe uh, should be at the front of our thinking. I do want to say, particularly as we segue to the technical aspects of Ken Velasquez's presentation, I do want to say that one of the things that has really impressed me since I have been here in Stratford is that whenever I receive correspondence from any family member, from any family member, and I'm saying this is happening at 100% um, submission rate, it has never just been, I am angry, or I'm upset about mass. They have paired it with research and rationale. And it doesn't mean that a decision is going to sway one way or another, but validating your, your position is a skill that every adult needs to have. It is an academic skill that we look to instill in our kids. 
So I'm happy that the decorum in conversation that I've had on the phone with families or through email has been pleasant. And as our families come up to the podium today to share their position or share their disposition, I do expect that level of positive decorum. Because wherever we stand on this topic, this is still one community. And these are still our children. So with that, um, I'll yield to the board if there's any questions. So you, the data was pulled Friday, but I was just curious if families still had a chance to view it. So the last pie chart that I saw uh, after I constructed this and I sent this to the board had approximately another 100 submissions, but it didn't move the distribution uh, significantly. Okay. Thank and you'll see that illustrated in Ms. Velasquez's presentation. everybody, uh, welcome families, uh, hello to my colleagues. So where do we go from here? Um, we had some good responses to our surveys and we're going to take that into consideration. As Dr. Sunday said, that's not going to only be one variable or the only variable that we're going to use to base our decision on how to proceed. So uh, we can begin with our slide presentation. As Dr. Sunday said, we had gotten uh, rec a recommendation from our uh, medical advisor, Dr. Landis. Um, he did share his thoughts with us this past week. He said he'd like to see the mask uh, mandate stay in place until the end of March again, and then we could regroup and, and adjust accordingly. We also reached out to Stratford Health Department. We could advance the slide. Um, and they were uh, able to provide us with a statement this afternoon um, they are still uh, waiting to hear from Connecticut DPH for some written guidance. So they did share some of their thoughts right now, but they are waiting for additional information to make their final recommendation to us. So I'll give you a minute to just kind of review the slide. Uh, we'll see that, you know, they are considering, you know, our current eligibility for vaccination. They'd like to see our vaccine rate, uh, vaccination rates increase, especially with our little ones. They also want to make sure that we have a plan in place. So if we did change our mask mandate on how we would proceed if we had a second surge, which is important. So you could review this side uh, also. Uh, again, they'd like to make sure that we have a plan in place to uh, address outbreaks, clusters, how are we going to manage that, how are we going to implement any safety strategies that we may need to adjust. That will be an uh, uh, important part to our plan moving forward if we make this adjust adjustment. Uh, a key point that I'd like to point out here is the, the transition from case investigation to routine disease control. This is something that we could use across the board, not just for COVID but also for general illnesses that we see each year throughout our schools, flu, uh, respiratory infections. So this would be something that would support that effort also to increase the healthiness of our children and our staff. So who else do we reach out to for guidance? Um, just as we have done in the past, uh, we consult with Connecticut DPH, and also the Department of, of Education. We have been meeting with them uh, almost for two years on a weekly basis. Uh, every Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, superintendents 
uh, school nurses, members of the board, different districts join us, and we discuss you know, where are we with our current COVID strategies, our numbers, mitigation, um, adjustments that we might need to make, vaccination rate, uh, increase, uh, surges, different variants. So just uh, this past week we met and I'd like to share with you our minutes from the meeting that we had. So Commissioner of Education opened the meeting along with DPH um, member Dr. Thomas St. Louis um, they also stressed that they're going to provide us with written guidance so we can have some framework uh, to know just how to proceed if we are going to make any adjustments with our mask mandate. Um, you can see that Dr. Carter, another member of DPH, recommended uh, that we, again, review what we know. CDC continues to recommend masks uh, in K-12. They do anticipate CDC updating their guidance too. Uh, you may have seen this in the news over the past 24 hours. I believe that they indicated that over the next week or so, we should have an update from CDC too. They were thinking that the CDC guidelines will reflect a recommendation versus a mandate. Another um, interesting point they pointed out during the meeting is, uh, will there be changes if we move to um, an optional mask plan uh, to quarantine and contact tracing. There is a possibility that we might go back to a little contact tracing uh, if we remove our masks. So that would be something that we'd need to take into consideration. Uh, one of the members uh, at the meeting posed a question to Dr. Carter uh, about masking and the member asked, do, do they think that the Connecticut Public Health Department is going to uh, suggest that maskings remain in school? Uh, you can see Dr. Carter's answer. He responded with masks help prevent the spread. Uh, for people that wish to reduce the risk of illness, masking is effective. Uh, most towns right now in the state of Connecticut are still in the red zone. Uh, so they are uh, looking to give us a framework of guidance uh, so we could base uh, on our own community transmission rates. Here's some additional information uh, in regards to the town of Stratford, our current case rates. Uh, you can see over the past four weeks, we're in a downward trend. Um, the first week uh, we're reporting on right now on this slide is January 20th. You can see there's almost 2,000 cases. The positivity rate then was 32.3%. Per, per you can see it come down nicely over the four week span. Currently the data that we have right now, uh, Stratford is at a 11.8% positivity rate. The next data will be coming out Thursday around three o'clock. Uh, this slide has a lot of information on it. I know some of the members of the board had time to look at it prior to our meeting. Um, but in summary, it gives us an idea of our number of cases that we were reported to the state from a time frame of August to our current um, month of December right now. And you can see, you know, early on when we started our school year, uh, we combined August and October because there were so few cases and that totaled to be 97. Uh, November came along, started to go up a little bit. Right around mid-November, we had thought about going to uh, screen and stay. Uh, in fact, our communication had gone out. In a matter of 48 hours, our numbers started to go up quite a bit, and we had to retract that. Uh, we were consistently on the upward trend from uh, mid-November to we until we returned in the beginning of January. If you look at that number in January, um, it's, it's overwhelming. It's over 1,100, almost 1,200 cases in one month. As you can see in February right now, our case uh, allotment right now is 60, uh, almost looking at uh, what August and October look like.
all right, our current vaccination rate. This is as, as updated as possible. We just clarified this slide with uh, the health department this afternoon. So the area of concern that we have is our little ones, as we mentioned in the previous presentation, for ages 5 to 11, um, we're looking at a vaccination rate of 24%. That's still on the low range. The remainder of the age groups, you can see um, all between 70 and 78%. Obviously, our um, 65 and older, uh, upward to 90 to 95%. Here in Stratford, um, the staff vaccination rate and our percentage right now, 95% um, of our staff is fully vaccinated. Um, there has been a recent update over the past 24 hours. For those who are not vaccinated, um, there will be no longer a weekly test required. Uh, SDE uh, will be sending out uh, additional written notice uh, and I'll be able to share that with you when I have it. Another example, another copy of our survey results from the family. Um, the last time I checked right before our meeting this afternoon uh, with the health department, we had 2,200 responses from our families. And again, the data still showed uh, the percentages to be exactly what we see on that slide. I think we had a good response in terms of our staff survey. We surveyed, surveyed almost 1,000 members. Uh, we, re we received uh, collectively 700 responses. I think that's a good amount. Um, and across the board, I think um, with each discipline, uh, it represented a good number of people. And for our last slide tonight, um, I, I called it our off-ramp. Uh, we are starting to use uh, hear that term. Um, using off-ramp as what are we going to do as we start to end this pandemic? What's our plan? We need a plan in place. So part of our off-ramp, where do we go with our masks? We need to decide. Things that we need to keep in consideration is if there is a time that someone needs to wear a mask, you know, who will need to wear the mask, when, why, and we need to support that with data and also specific um, detail so people understand if there's a requirement needed. And again, I don't have an example right now, but we need to be flexible there. There might still be a high risk situation, or if we have another surge, we might have to come back to the table and talk about this too and reinstate it. Late this afternoon, early childhood services put out uh, their recommendation in regards to pre-K. There was some discussion about if pre-K was going to be um, still required to wear masks, and right now they said that it can be lifted if the district decides. Communication, a big part of the off-ramp. If we were to move to uh, lifting our mask mandate, it's imperative that as adults uh, we model respectful behavior with one another so that our children can do the same. Um, for those who decide to wear a mask and for those who choose not to wear a mask, we need to be respectful of each other. And um, we are their best examples. So it's okay to disagree. It's okay to have a different opinion and a personal choice if you're going to do uh, what's best for your personal health. But we need to do that with kindness. What else will we do on our off-ramp? We'll continue to provide rapid COVID testing, um, home kits to our families and staff. Those who have signed up for Project COVID Detect through the state of Connecticut, that's our weekly testing that many of our schools participate in. That will continue until June. PCRs obviously are still can, can continue to be offered. Um, those are the tests that we send out. Uh, on a note though, I'd like to stress that PCR levels are reported to the state and data is collected. They do not have data on home testing. So when we look at a positivity rate for a town, that's PCRs reported. So there is a percentage 
of positive cases that are not collected in that number. Again, part of the plan, continue with updating our guidance, uh, both on the local level, um, the district level, and then any recommendations from our colleagues at CDC or DPH. Social distancing, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, and then also doing what we, I think we've been doing a pretty good job at, is modifying and adjusting um, our events and celebrations according to the transmission rate. If it goes up, we may need to pull back. If it goes down, you know, we could increase our guests at gatherings, um, dances, typical graduation celebrations, all those good things that we look forward to having again. Our vaccination clinics will continue until June. We have a relationship with Griffin Health and the Yellow Van Program. Um, we will have one more at Johnson House coming up as a second dose clinic. And then the next two will be at Franklin and Nichols. So that's what my, my vision, our vision is for an off ramp. And then the information that we presented tonight will be taken into consideration to try to make the best decision in regards to lifting the mask mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Um, Ms. Vasquez, can you please tell me uh, the percentage of students that are currently vaccinated? I know as a parent, the survey came to me for the very first time last week, and what was the response on that? Um, we had about uh, 300 families respond, so I can't really give you an accurate uh, percentage in terms of that that number we received because not all families are willing to share that information. Right, so that's why we're basing our current vaccination rates on time. No, the current vaccination right now, the rate that you saw on my slide is from the Stratford Health Department. Right, and so it's, it's, that's, that's our guidance, that's what we're using. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was our hope to provide you with more information in regards to how many students were vaccinated at each school. That was the intent of that survey, but because so few responded, I don't think it's, I mean, it's, of, of course we'll look at that, but um, it doesn't give a, a, a true picture, I don't think. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Vasquez, just a quick question about um, the vaccination rates as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at the, you know, the 12 to 17 range, the 18 to 24, maybe not so much the 5 to 11, but is fully vaccinated three shots or two? Sorry? Is fully vaccinated three shots or two? So fully vaccinated would mean if you had Pfizer or um, Moderna, it would be the two dose that's fully vaccinated. We have yet to include booster being full, fully vaccinated. So um, I know you had made a comment uh, about contact tracing, you know, talking some of our, our nurses, I'm sure you have as well, they're, they're significantly overwhelmed. Contract tracing was, was a nightmare for them, and going to screen and stay allowed them to release. There's actually a TV show tonight on Channel A, if anybody wants to watch it, about uh, about our nurses' inability to wait. Yeah. Our nurses' inability to provide health care to our children because of the overwhelming responsibilities that have been dumped on them because of COVID and contact. That's what the said on GLA and some of the, <coughs> some of the research, but um, I know it's significant. And, and, you know, when we talk about the science, you look at school districts like East Haven that never went remote and had no higher or lower uh, infection rate than, than we did. Um, we, in, in, the, in the private sector, Continue. I know the mayor lifted the uh, mask mandate in town hall buildings uh, last week because of the reduction in COVID. They say the science says that, that the schools are a place where transmissions are, are the least, are, are, are minimal. The paperwork that came out around December said that the contract tracing wasn't work, that it's not really going to pass through the school districts. Um, you know, we keep talking about washing hands. The science says that that's not how it's transmitted. Back in the beginning, you know, when this first came out, I was afraid that wash your hands and wash your hands out by the fact. The science came out. We keep promoting these things and we keep saying we're going to do the science. When are we going to stop promoting things that science say isn't working? When are we going to take it? I mean, we're in the private world. We go to bars, we go to restaurants, we go out in the real world. You know, we, we, we 
We live our lives like normal people. And we're forcing our kids to not do that. They have a whole social, uh, emotional con, con, uh, piece to that. You know, they, the kids aren't allowed to, you know, speaking to speech people, the, the kids develop their speech patterns through watching speech that's being robbed from them. I mean, besides losing the education, which Kate calls it lost education, I think, or miseducation, as it's term for it. Mr. Hendrick, they, do you have, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have a question for in response? I love this comments, too. Um, I, I mean, so when you say the science, so what, which science, like, are we looking at the most restrictive? Are we looking at the most effective? Are we taking into account all the social, emotional you know, facts? It, it, it's just confusing when I keep hearing that, and, and we keep going to the most restrictive one that can call itself safe. But you know, are, are we looking at the long quality effects? I think as a team, um, I think Dr. Asani would agree with me. I think we're we've done a pretty good job at looking at all different aspects of this, and everything you said is very true and is very important. So we're not looking at just one variable. Um, it's a fine line that we walk with this. There's a balance that we have to come to. And we're also, we have to think about, we are going towards the end of this pandemic and need to make adjustments. And early on, we knew what we knew and we did what we had to do at the time. And there'll be studies years to come from now. And, and people will look at it and say, you know, did we do a good job? What did we learn from it? Could we do something different in the future? There'll be more pandemics, and we'll learn from the one that we just lived through. So I think we're doing a, a pretty good job right now at looking at all different variables. And another question. You had, you had talked also about uh, staff vaccination, the post staff vaccination. But I know that was a case that we brought up in the Supreme Court. I think I'm the president that tried mandating uh, large corporations to uh, for mandatory vaccinations. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know the outcome of that. Is, is that, are we still even allowed to do that? Yeah. I'll have to follow up in terms of regard the law to that. I know that districts can request um, someone to be vaccinated to work in their company or facility, um, but I could follow up with more legal reference to that. Yeah, I know our government suspended that as well. Right. I'm not familiar with the Supreme Court case, but the government's orders and their will expire. I believe it actually expired on the 15th. So, you know, the question from uh, Ms. Velasquez's piece about the weekly testing, and that's all in, the, in effect, so to speak. But I, I think, Mr. Hendrick, I think you bring up a good point. Um, and as I said, as I preface in my presentation, uh, whether it's the off ramp or so on and so forth, you know, the one thing that we will say a thousand times over is that we're educators. We're not experts. And when it comes to the uh, pandemic, we've had to learn a lot about it over the last two and a half or so years. And it's been a challenge. So whenever we fall short of our scope of expertise, we lean on the experts. And as much as we 100% are committed to making sure that all of our kids are six possible, there's a general statute that requires that in the Board of Education. We also know that on the flip side of the coin, there are people who are in the hospital and lost their lives. So it's trying to find this delicate balance, really having an intimate knowledge of who we are as a community, where we are. And I think you heard Mr. Velasco mention that we have done a quality job of editing for them okay, and trying to release the restrictions. One of the biggest assets in terms of student achievement, I've spoken to this board over the last couple of months in terms of what we look like. One of the biggest assets in the work is our parents being at our doors and partnering with us. Tony goes from the lens of somebody who used to be a former principal. Somebody who used to do this work as a school counselor. And it pained us not to send that letter to our families to say everything has to be virtual. You and I have had informal conversations um, about how effective, how much more effective in person meetings are. So we've ebbed and flowed. And we think we do have an opportunity here based on how we continue to have these conversations and assess our metrics. But if, if, <coughs> Things turn around, and there's a new variant. The board has to be prepared to make challenging decisions to reinforce past. So there is no clean answer to that. I think you're asking all the right questions. But at the same time, I, I would like to, at the very least, let our constituents know that we're educators who have to learn a significant amount over the last three years about this field of medicine. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And Dr. Sunday's comment goes right to my question, <laughs> uh, which is about um, if we get to a place where we're making mask a choice or removing, you know, the requirement. As you're thinking about the off ramp, I, I think you said uh, social distancing. Um, two questions: How will this impact in-person instruction? One. And are we going to have a plan in place to space kids out considering, you know, let's say it is optional, right? Yep. Now are they going to be back to being close together? Are we going to require them to be X number of feet apart? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, we actually brought that question up uh, to our panel. Okay. Not just this past week, but we knew this was coming eventually that we would have to discuss this. Um, and what would it look like? Yeah. And I have to be very frank with you. They're thinking about it right now, too. And they want to recommend the best guidance that they could give us. Um, and if we have to adjust something, um, we'll look at that as part of, can we do that, you know, safely? So the, I don't have an answer for you, but I know that um, DPH is discussing that. It is, and that's the answer. You know, we were all on the call yesterday and um, the superintendent are frustrated because DPH essentially requested more time. We understand the pressure is not telling them. But ultimately, if we go this way, we need some kind of medical expertise to give us guidance on how to effectively do this and min minimize um, any kind of risk of transmission. So we're waiting for that information to come back from DPH. Uh, as Mr. Lasky says, uh, I'm on the regular phone call with uh, our colleagues at the uh, public forum here in our town. Resource. And we're at the point state where we're tracking our internal metrics. As well as listening to all students. So Dr. Sunday, to my question about in-person instruction, you know, the, the report that we got showed 95% staff vaccination rate. We understand even with the vaccine, people will still get sick. So how are we, what are you hearing or discussing in terms of if we remove the requirement, how will that impact the kids in, in class? I think, I think it's definitely going to impact the kids. So for one, um, our children have been in mass for two and a half years. So there's going to be a cultural shift, right, in terms of school culture. Um, for our youngest ones, first and second grade, they have known nothing different. Mm -hmm. So this is a whole new world for them. Um, I think when, when, when you pose a question like that, we have to assess that against uh, the pie chart mm -hmm. in terms of our staff response, in terms of their readiness to go and teach without the past. Mm -hmm. I think the last variable piece of this is, what have we learned over the last two years of the pandemic? I'm talking about past adults, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's a part of this piece that if we migrate to this direction, which a lot of districts are having this conversation, is this notion of being self-responsible, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have some level of control as to whether or not you want to be socially distant. Right? And I think you heard Ms. Velasco speak uh, quite robustly about, in this process, we may have to re-educate our kids about what it means to be socially distant, particularly if you don't have a mask on and respecting people's faces. We've begun to have those conversations um, at the administrative level. Uh, last week I spoke to our principal office. Um, a lot of them had some good ideas. But we cannot solidify our conversation thoughts around this until we get some guidance from DPH. So that's larger than what we're And one more question, sorry. So um, the State Department of Ed has the authority to reimpose a mask mandate until June 30th, right? So do we need to do anything? You know, let's say we suspended our policy or whatever, make a change to our policy. Would we need to have something in place to react quickly? Should something happen? Talk to us a little bit about that. So, uh, if I'm understanding the question, so yes, uh, the way the way to go was uh, written into law is that after the 28th, um, control goes to the local municipality. However, the State Department of Education, as well as the PH, have the ability to reimpose if there's a resurgence mm -hmm. or if there's a new variant that emerges. In that case, I think what we'll do is we internally continue to monitor our numbers and our case rates. Um, ultimately, um, we will also have the ability to impose that if we choose. 
So would that be reactivating a policy or creating a new policy or just? And that's, that's a conversation here. It wouldn't be uh, creating a new policy because we already have a policy in place. However, if uh, past the 20 years we decide to go past the choice, mm -hmm. we would have to sunset the old policy, otherwise we'd be as compliance of our own policy internally. Mm -hmm. um, but if we temporarily sunset it and we monitor this all the way to June, uh, we have the ability to support back if our conditions suggest so. And I think, just as a follow-up, um, if we do move forward with a change, part of that, when we roll it out, and when we, if we roll it out, um, it would include, mm -hmm. if this happens, Got it. Okay. this is what we're going to do, or how we're going to approach it. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a, you know, step by step. So it, it, we're prepared. So we know what um, we need to do in case the surge comes again, or another variant, um, you know, happens to be on our doorstep. Super. So that'll be part of that plan. So, I mean, you're talking about creating a whole new, and I'm guessing the board, this board voted voted on the current mass policy, which is this board would need to vote any changes to it, um, whether it was the sunset or to make changes to it. But when this mass policy was created, it, we didn't know all the, all the variables at that point. I mean, I, I know it's good to have, have uh, points of reference in there just that allow you to make change, but, but there's no way that to, to to uh, predict all the things that might happen. So it, it's going to be impossible for us to cover all the bases. I mean, th this meeting, which was called the 24 hour notice, which, you know, I guess you would be uh, public council, but I'll comment about that later. But, um, we can call another meeting and change it if, if, the need, if the need arises. But the mass policy was something that was created by the board and voted on by the board. Correct. I believe that's how we went about it initially, yes. It was adopted by the board, that is correct. I believe it was constructed and created by uh, the advice of medical experts, correct? If anything we've learned along the, along the way is that uh, we need to pivot, we've heard that word, be flexible, and, and that pivoting, it, it could be a change in 24 hours. Uh, and to your point about you know the meeting being convened within you know 24 hours notice, there's so much changing right now at the state level and DPH. Um, you know, we sit in those meetings every Tuesday morning, and what we could discuss, and by the uh, something can change by the end of the week. Um, and what we try to do to provide the most um, information to the board and to the public, we try to be very transparent. What we're learning, we're sharing with you. If that requires a change, uh, a change in plan, more notification, more clarification. I think we've done a pretty good job at that thus far. Um, we're always going to learn from what we've done. We can always improve upon it. And you're you're absolutely right. I don't know what the future predicts in terms of more pandemics. I don't know if we're going to have to modify things, um, but we will. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, the next portion of our agenda is public comment. Uh, first, let me thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, speakers will present their comments from the podium and are encouraged not to engage in personal attacks. Uh, this board expects that each speaker will be courteous, modeling for our students how one can advocate for a position uh, while also respectfully disagreeing with another's opinion. Uh, speakers will have three minutes. Mrs. Wiltsey will be keeping time and she will offer you a signal when your time is nearly up. And my apologies in advance if I mispronounce any names. Um, our, our first speaker tonight is Nicole Kanata. Also, if you could please state your name and your address before you speak. My name is Nicole Kanata. I live at 550 Windsor Ave. I have a junior at Stratford High and a third grader at Wilcox Elementary School. I'm just going to get right to the point. I feel at this point, you need to let the parents decide. Our kids are suffering. Um, so many towns in the state have made this call already with the children's best interest in mind. Not to mention, Connecticut is one of the last states in this country to still have this ridiculous mandate in effect. Friday night, I went to the Stratford High basketball game to watch my nephew play. 
I was disgusted watching young men run up and down a court, profusely sweating in masks. It was terrible to watch. I ha I've never run in a mask in a hot gymnasium, have any of you? It was terrible. It was terrible to watch. Two days later, we watched a Super Bowl with 78,000 unmasked people in an indoor facility. Make it make sense, because it doesn't anymore. Um, sorry. The next morning, I had to watch my nine-year-old put his mask on and walk into school, and I actually felt sick about it. He comes home every day. He has a headache because his ears hurt. His mask is fill, full of dirt, blood, markers, you name it, food, it's in there. He's getting screamed at by lunch ladies. The second he's done biting his little sandwich, he's still chewing his food. He's being told to put his mask on. Can't have a sip of water in class. Put your mask on. We were told our kids were going to get two mask breaks in elementary. They're not getting two mask breaks. My daughter's a junior in Stratford High. Her entire high school career has been with this pandemic. Canceled her ring dance multiple times. Hybrid learning, remote learning. She's suffering. She's on a, a regimen of a ton of acne medications because the mask has ruined her skin, ruined her self-esteem. I can't take no more. I'm exhausted. I am exhausted as a parent. We're all exhausted. All we're asking is for a choice. Let us pick what we want for our kids. If you want your kid in a mask, send your kid in a mask. But I don't want to send my kid in a mask anymore. So I'm asking, please, hear us out. We're begging you at this point. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Kelly Garofalo. My name is Kelly Garofalo, and I live at 616 Chickadee Lane. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me take this time to speak tonight. I know there are tons of parents that wish they could be here right now. Um, they couldn't find last-minute sitters, and they're pretty upset about it because they have a voice in this, too. The leader of our state decided to lift a variety of executive orders on February 28th. This was his advice from collective experts. What he was basically telling the state is that we are not in a state of emergency and we won't be in the future. We have the tools in place to move forward. We followed the guidelines for two years, we wore masks, and we followed what the state said. We now know that cloth masks have little public health benefit and significant downsides. Do we know the long-term harm we are doing to our kids while we're keeping them uncomfortably masked for seven hours a day? Children develop based on facial cues. We are depriving kids of the ability to read people's reactions, to know what their friends and parents are feeling at that moment. They are not able to freely express themselves and share with their classmates. They are able, able to build friendships and connect with anyone during the school day. I have a story from my five-year-old who's in kindergarten. He has a kindness chart for the month of February. Each day there's an assigned act of kindness. One of the assignments was to share with a friend. I asked my son if he had shared with anyone at school that day. His response was, no mom, we aren't allowed to share. I said, what do you mean? And he said, we play by ourselves at our desk during indoor recess. I can't touch my friend's toys and he can't touch mine. If I do, I'll get in trouble. How sad is that? My five-year-old isn't allowed to share with his friends. Since the start of the school year, my daughter has had to go to the school nurse with more bloody noses than I can count on my hands. My son has had an increase in anxiety and has cried in the mornings before school because he's too hot in his mask and he can't breathe. He comes home with headaches often. Sometimes he even grabs a pillow and puts it over his head or turns off all the lights in the house. This is not normal. I debated getting him a head scan, but after tracking his headaches, we discovered this doesn't happen on the weekends. It only happens during school days. So are the masks the issue? The knowledge and education of our mask choice community is growing in Stratford. We are not asking for everyone to remove their masks. We are asking for the right to choose what is best for our own children. The parents should have a choice. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Catherine Brezza.
Hi, I'm Kat Brezza. I have two children at Lordship School and I live on Pauline Street. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak tonight and advocate for mass choice for our kids. As I was walking out the door, my eight-year-old reminded me, don't get upset, mommy. It will all be fine. Just tell them why we need these masks off already. Well, if it were that easy, Jake, easy to convey the need for mass choice, all while suppressing my strong emotions, as you can hear, that would flood this room, filling it with tons of sadness, anger, frustration, guilt, shame as a parent. I will try my best to suppress those, those emotions for the next two minutes. We all have our never-ending COVID story, and we do not need to agree on how we navigate or act in the COVID situation, but it's time for us as a community to change the narrative, no matter what your story is or what your story was. I have one child who has never, ever been to school without a mask. So to describe what his story looks like, he has been forced to learn to read, write, and start his early childhood academic development without ever seeing his teacher's lips move, facial expression, or ability to connect and tap into his needs as the visual learner that he is. Every child also has been limited socially with the inability to make connections with their peers given all the protocols in place, including masks, shields, social distancing, and more. We cannot continue to dissect, resect, evaluate, reevaluate all the data, the science, the evidence, whatever you want to call it, in an attempt to interpret it to arrive at a perfect solution. This is an ongoing COVID situation. That would be impossible. There is no perfect solution. At this point, we need to find common ground. My beliefs and my actions are very different than many people in this room and in this town. But what remains the same is we know that there is no perfect solution and we all deserve the right to choose what is best for our kids. The Target and Old Navy masks that our kids are wearing are doing nothing in regards for transmission and protection against COVID-19. To take it one step further, I know that masks actually have more of a negative impact on my kids than did the actual virus. COVID affects everyone differently, and I'm not here to debate that or share my family's story on how easy it was to overcome the COVID after we were contracted, after we contracted it this past year. There's a plethora of articles, along with tons of recognition now by the CDC, the WHO, Fauci, stating that children are not, and I quote, at increased risk of severe COVID-19. And there is finally recognition that was not mentioned tonight that natural immunity does in fact exist. It is more than apparent if you step out, of, step out in public where we are no, that we are no longer in a state of emergency. We must stop using our kids, stop inappropriately saying they're a resilient. I'm so sorry, that's three minutes. Okay, and resilient for false security. I demand that we have the freedom to choose what is best for our kids. Um, next up, Melanie and Dave Costa. Hi, my name is Melanie Costa. Um, I'm, I live on Layton Drive. I'm here tonight to ask to end mask mandates, and I'm here tonight to represent my three children who don't have a voice in this matter. I have a kindergarten, third grader, and a seventh grader. As members of the Board of Education, the parents and children of Stratford School look up to you for support and leadership in our school system. As the leaders of our schools, I ask you to please make the mask mandate a mask choice um, on February 28th. As a parent, the feeling of, not, of having your rights to make a decision about your child to be stripped away are feelings that don't settle well. We are in full government control, and our children and parents do not have a voice or say. Our state is one of the highest vaccinated states, yet our children are still in mass. In a recent study done, that carbon dioxide levels that children are breathing in while wearing masks are three times higher than what is considered safe. My daughter, daughter started preschool at Second Hill Lane last year. My little three-year-old entered school for the very first time. It's supposed to be fun and exciting, but was full of fear, anxiety, and confusion. My daughter is happy and friendly to everyone she knows. However, she was hiding behind her mask. There was many days I was called to pick her up from the nursing office because she vomited while wearing a mask from her anxiety and lack of oxygen. 
We would cry together when she came home and describe and explain her day in a mask. As a mother, I feel hopeless and I feel defeated and angry. I also have two other children who were in second and sixth grade last year. Here are a few things they would tell me after school. I felt like I could not breathe, especially during gym class. My second grader almost passed out, so we opted out of gym class that whole entire year. I felt dizzy, Mom. I was scared my teacher would be mad at me if I pulled it down for a breath of air. I felt dizzy. This is not fair, Mom. My kids come in my car. The first thing they do is they rip off their mask and say, oh, I could breathe now. That's not a good feeling when you pick up your kids. The masks are sometimes sweaty and dirty um, when I pick them up. Their worlds are flipped upside down the last two and a half years. Their freedom stripped away. When is someone going to stand up for these kids? These are our children we are talking about. It's time for Stratford to stand up with other towns to make masks optional. Take a walk outside your homes. What do you see? I see kids happy, unmasked at festivals, zoos, aquariums. I see the Super Bowl, no masks. Let's kids be kids. I hear adults saying, well, masks are easy to wear. Kids are resilient. Oh, my kids love wearing masks. Well, I'm here to speak up tonight that not all children can wear masks. Some have a hard time wearing them, and they're unable to speak up for themselves. And children are wearing these masks for six hours a day, five days a week. This is a long period of time, and it can be hard for some children. It's different than a trip to the grocery store with kids. This is a six-hour period a day. I thank you for taking the time to listen to me tonight and giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of my kids. Um, please let's get kids back to normal and have parents make a decision on whether they want their kids to be masked. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jenna Wright. Thank you, Dr. Sunday and the Board of Ed. Um, I have two teenage boys. I live on uh, Longbrook Avenue, by the way. Uh, I have two teenage boys, and they're both suffering so much from the masks. And one of them has asthma. The other one has allergies. They both have been suffering. Um, and since Lamont has has issued guidance to end the mask mandate. I strongly believe that the masks in our school should come to an end for all grades K through 12. Two years has caused detrimental effects on many children and families. Parents deserve to make the decision on what benefits their children's health. There have not been any studies in the past two years that prove that masks are safe and effective for children to wear all day. In fact, I would like to see proof that it's not causing harm to their immune systems, their development, and their mental health. While some say kids are resilient, what might be right for one kid is not right for another. Um, I also wanted to point out that there's been, there have been a lot of you know, um, teachers who protested the reopening of the schools. And then weeks later, they were out at bars and they were doing things normally over the summer, going on vacation and things like that. And our kids had to suffer going back into school virtually for part of the year. And then the second half of the year was in masks. And now we're still in masks at this point. Um, so I just want to say that I'm just asking respectively if you just put our children's needs first. My kids have had COVID, they both recovered, and um, I know that a lot of people have been through a lot harder times. We've had family members that have been through rough times with COVID, but um, I think the kids need to get back to normal. They need to be able to go to sports and dances and just have normal things in life and not have to suffer any longer. It's just been so hard for our family, and I know for many other families, I don't just speak for myself, and I know the data that you showed um, doesn't represent the whole population of our school. It's a small sample of the school, and I just wanted to mention that too. There are a lot of other parents that wanted to be here tonight that didn't get here. So um, I'm just asking if you could please consider making it optional because it's just not fair to the kids who are really having a hard time with it. And you know, especially one of my sons has sensory issues, and it, it's like painful for him to wear a mask, and it's hurting him socially, emotionally, and yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next 
speaker will be Kevin Para Parago. Yeah, Parago. Uh, so my name is Kevin Perigo. I live on Francis Terrace, and uh, thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. This is super important for us to address. So, you know, I echo every, everything these ladies have said. I think for, as a parent, you know, there's no bigger responsibility than protecting our children. And so, you know, there's a lot of data out there that's confusing, to be quite honest with you. A lot of this data, it took a lot of effort. Thank you. But there's also other sides to it. You know, my family has had COVID. We've gotten over it. You know, and I can say I've also lost family members who pulled died from it. But at the end of the day, I got to look at my kids in their face every day and see a mask on them. And honestly, they fidget with it. I just like I am. It's uncomfortable. And I get it. You guys have been in the same with it, you know, same situation as us all in the last two and a half years. I just plead, please, like consider the fact that it should be a choice. Again, my vitamins don't work, right? If I don't take them. Your vitamins, it's just that it goes down this whole road, right? Like we can take self-care and we can treat others with respect and we can value, you know, their, their distance that they want to, you know, keep away. But honestly, interaction is key for these children. My kids, they put on a mask, they freak out. You know, it's hard. I, I walk my daughter to the door every day, no mask, and she puts it on. She wants to break down and cry. The psychological effect is not being talked about, and I think it needs to be addressed. And again, learning, you're right. Kids wanting to see the lips move. People, you know, like smiles are huge. I go to the gym every day, honestly, I don't wear a mask. People come up to me just random. Hey, you know what, you're smiling. It made my day. Like this is huge, this is a huge impact in our children's lives. Please just give us the chance to make that choice. And again, if our kids are sick, we're gonna keep them home. I think if anything, it's reiterated the fact that if our, we don't feel good, we just stay home. We keep our distance. We're not forcing anybody into a situation that they're uncomfortable with. But please, consider all of what everyone's talking about and allow us to make that choice. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Jorniak. She had to leave. Her son was with her. Okay. Um, okay, next up then is Yevgeny Gerasimov. Good evening, dear Stratford BOE members. My name is Evgeny Gerasimov. I live at uh, 32 Happy Hollow in uh, Stratford. So my wife and I, I oppose the policy of uh, wearing masks full time by our children while at schools. Um, I urge you to make masks optional for Stratford students. Um, it's now allowed for municipalities to do so, and there's no, um, you know, real reason to keep it this way. So. Uh, a couple of points I wanted to convey. First, masks make uh, learning for younger children much harder. Um, my son is five years old and uh, English is his second language. So, um, you know, he needs to uh, see how to properly speak and, uh, and read. So he needs to see how words and sounds are formed. Um, you know, he needs to see lips, teeth and tongues of his teachers and classmates and masks prevent all of this. Um, it's also hard for him to learn how to write with mask, so close with his eyes. Um, in addition, a school is where kids learn how to be responsible members uh, of our society and how to interact with others. To learn this skill, kids need to interact without fear and learn how to read facial expressions. How are they going to do it if everyone is still wearing masks and being very afraid of getting the virus and it's, um, you know, the virus is basically like a cold to these kids. Second, masks are ineffective. Closed masks do not stop viral transmission and can even be harmful when worn for prolonged periods of time. After a day of wearing, a child's mask can be contaminated with bacteria. Uh, masks can also prevent kids from getting the right amount of oxygen necessary for brain and body to function. My son hates wearing masks and he constantly complains about difficult breathing wearing one, especially when he exercises. Um, for his extracurricular activities, we especially were looking for a place that does not mandate masks and found one in Fairfield, which is uh, kids strong. 
Finally, masks are not needed at this point. Um, it makes very little public health sense to keep masks mandatory at schools at this point. Uh, our vaccination rate in Connecticut is one of the highest in the nation, if not in the world. Um, my understanding is our teachers have received vaccinations and boosters um, already, and many Stratford students have been also vaccinated. Um, many of other students got COVID and uh, now have natural immunity, and uh, the rest, if they get COVID, you know, there will be only mild symptoms and uh, almost nobody gets hospitalized you know, for kids uh, with full recovery and natural immunity at the end. Um, if some teachers or parents want to continue wearing masks, you know, that's fine. They should be allowed to do so if it's their choice, but uh, the mandate should go away. Thank you, and I'm sorry, that's three minutes. Uh, Good evening, my name is Erica DeVito and I live at 165 Boulevard Drive. My son is in kindergarten at Eli Whitney Elementary School. Nearly two years ago, we all holed up in our homes, scared, wiping down our produce, letting our groceries air out for days at a time, sanitizing our doorknobs, we learned not to sneeze in public and to hold in that cough. I gave birth to my third child in early May of 2020, right in the midst of the chaos. We waited for vaccinations to come and we masked up. As time has gone on, we have emerged from our homes, embraced our family members, gone back to school and extracurricular activities. All while learning many of the precautions we have taken along the way were extreme, unnecessary and borderline harmful. We know that surface transmission of COVID-19 is highly unlikely. We now know that conventional masking protects the wearer and poses no protection for those around them. We know that N95 masks can protect the wearer regardless of what is happening around them. These are not protecting our children or our teachers. They are yet another extreme that for some reason or another are providing a false sense of security for some and a heightened anxiety for others. Our children are not okay. They are afraid, afraid of COVID, a virus which has mostly mild symptoms in children, afraid of getting in trouble or arrested as my son once told me for dropping his mask below his mouth to eat a pretzel at the mall. Our teachers are not okay. Their jobs have been made more complicated by parameters put in place by you. They have students repeat themselves time and time again behind partitions while also behind masks. They read students' emotions solely by the look in their eyes. They communicate sounds using their mouths, which are shielded by a cloth. Us parents are not okay. We are tired and we are confused and we are frustrated. I'm asking you to join many of the surrounding towns that have gone mass choice and give me back my God-given rights as a parent. Thank you. next speaker will be Jeffrey Keller. Good evening. My name's uh, Jeff. I live at 40 Ridge Road in Stratford. Uh, my little girl Penny goes to Eli Whitney. She's uh, five. And, you know, I, I don't have facts, you know, to share with you. I could share my experience. My little girl went to school in September and she was fine. And within a week, she had a stuffy nose every day of the week. And then Friday would come around Saturday and she'd clear up. Sunday she'd be fine. Then Monday she'd go back. By Monday night, Tuesday morning, she'd have a stuffy nose. And it would just keep going over and over and over again. You know, we'd take the mask off and she'd be fine over the weekends. And so I'd ask her pediatrician, you know, he said, well, you know, you're not really supposed to be breathing in the same stuff all day long. And you look in the mask at the end of the day, just like uh, this one over here said, have you seen inside these masks at the end of the day? They're full of snots and, and spit and blood, you know? And my kid's nose is all chafed up and her cheeks. She's got chapped lips nonstop every night. Daddy, my face hurts. You know, I got a headache. And, and then we took him out of school for a little while. We went down to Jamaica for a week. The kids were fine. 
You know, they go on a vacation for four days with school break or whatever. You shut school down because some kid was exposed and she's out of school for a few, she's fine. She goes back in, she puts the mask on, sniffles. I mean, look, I'm not a doctor, but I'm not an idiot, you know? And I, I, I know these things are screwing her up. And beyond that, I mean, it's, it's messing with her head. She's the sweetest little girl and she's getting bummed out because, you know, she's trying to express her emotions to her friends. And I mean, she's explaining to me like a five-year-old, but I know what she's saying. She's not able to smile to her friends. And she thinks she's screwing up and her friends aren't happy with her because she can't show them that she's smiling. And she's telling them a funny story. She doesn't think she's being funny. Even though the night before, we, we were talking the story. And I thought, oh, that's a funny one, you know? And she goes to school and she's not, is she, Daddy, I don't think my friends thought I was telling a funny story. That's just terrible. She, she's at that age where she's supposed to be learning socializing. And, I mean, she's learned how to spell her name, but she's supposed to be learning how to talk to her friends. And this seeing from here up isn't working. She needs to see smiles, and she needs to smile back. And, and it's not fair to take that away from her. Or any of these kids, even the older kids. I mean, think about it. Remember when you were 15, you're trying to flirt with somebody? <laughs> How the hell are you going to flirt? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not fair. These kids are going through these the, 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 the best years of your life. And they're not even, you know, it sucks already to bury it in the phones all day long, but, you know, these kids can't even be kids. I mean, I, I, what I would do to be 17, 18 years old again, you know? And, and think about it, all that, all that stuff is being taken away from them for a piece of paper over your face that really, I mean, come on, you know? I know, I know, I'm up. But I'll just finish with, you know, they leave school and then we can all go sit in the pizza restaurant no mask. You know, we can all go to the concert, no mask. Doesn't make any sense. This place is no different. Our next speaker is Dana Vasquez. Dana Vasquez. I live at 1510 Broadbridge Avenue. I have two daughters who are in middle school here. Um, I just wanted to say that I respect everyone's right to decide to take care of their family and themselves as they see fit. As everyone said, and I'm sure you guys all know, these are not doing anything. The only thing that is protecting you if you want to protect yourself are N95s and a vaccine, which clearly doesn't even stop the spread, so I don't know why we are taking a survey to see how many kids are vaccinated, because I just, it's just all too much, because it's, yes, like, it might be protecting them, but it's not stopping the spread, as we've all seen through Omicron. Um, so we, I think we could probably all agree with that, or maybe not, I don't know. But these, these masks, young children's IQ have decreased by 20 points because of the masking. Their mental health is suffering. Suicide has increased by 51% in teenage girls. That is huge. And I can guarantee you that the masks have a lot to do with that. My own daughter now prefers to hide behind her mask because she has braces and to hide the occasional pimple. How sad is that? Those adolescent experiences and all the social emotions that make us more human are being stolen from our children for the sake of holding on to outdated COVID mandates that have proven to be ineffective. Plus, masks are not stopping or even slowing the spread of this disease. All masking is doing is raising a whole generation of children who will grow up with huge social and emotional deficiencies, unattached to the importance of facial expression that makes us all uniquely human. Thank you for listening and advocating for school choice. Our next speaker is Jillian Mulford. I'm Jillian Mulkern. I live at 889 Wilcoxon Avenue. 
Um, so I was going to restate the positivity percentage in Connecticut is 11%. Do we know the death rate between kids of ages 5 to 19? I do. I looked it up. According to the CDC, per 100,000 cases, this includes associated, so not only due to, plus probable, so not definite, five cases in Connecticut. Okay, I have never spoken publicly before, so please bear with me and my nerves. I'm here because I strongly support the removal of the masks in school. I will let you know that for the end of 2019, I removed both of my children from public school and homeschooled them both. At the time, one was in preschool and one was in second grade going into third grade. For personal reasons, I re-enrolled my children back into public school this year. Both of my children kept right on track and were even slightly above their peers when returning to public school. Now my child in fourth grade and a child in kindergarten. Within these past six months alone, I have noticed speech problems in both of my children. My fourth grader has started mumbling and my kindergartner, who was doing really well with his letters entering into kindergarten, has had a difficult time pronouncing his letters and, in my opinion, has regressed from where we were in homeschooling. Children learn letters and words by seeing the mouth's shape and how the lips move when creating words. I don't know about you, but since wearing masks, I've realized that I read lips more than I thought. Imagine how difficult it is for children learning and to read and write. Both of my children also have a hard time reading the emotions of their peers and their teachers. Currently, we know that children are not at high risk for dying from COVID. At this time, I feel that masks are doing more harm to our children than good. I feel that if parents are worried about their children, they can mask them but it should be a personal decision and not mandatory. And our final speaker tonight is Grace Myron Dominguez. My name is Grace Myron Dominguez. I live on 125 Ferreira Boulevard and I am an eighth grader at Flood Middle School. Serving government is one of my biggest aspirations for when I grow up. So when I had the opportunity to speak about such a pressing subject, I couldn't pass it up. I know a lot of kids my age don't think so far into the future or how what they do now and how their actions can change it. But this is one of our opportunities to think about what we do now in this moment and how it will affect our lives going forward. So with that in mind, I speak in front of you today with the hope and intent that I can help you decide what you want your future to be like. In my opinion, as a 13-year-old student that wears a mask six hours a day, and I mean this with no disrespect, that if the Board of Education decides to take away this mask mandate, then it is not doing the job that is in its description. The job of the Board of Education is very important, consisting of making decisions that not only benefit the students in this district, but will have a lasting impact, making school a healthy and safer, safer place for us to be. This mandate has done just that, but taking it away would erase all of the progress we have made in the past two years. I'm going to go back to when this all started at the beginning of 2020. This next part you might find particularly interesting. And that was a time when the seven day average number of new reported cases in Connecticut never exceeded 3,000. That was also a time that people started to wear masks and Governor Lamont issued an executive order recommending that people wear face covering back in August of 2020. Fast forward to the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, and we now have a seven day average of 10,000 new cases. To me, that is no reason to take away this mandate. If anything, it proves that we need stricter guidelines in our state. Over the holiday break, Governor Lamont Health officials, including our local government here in Stratford, recommended against large gatherings, and if you do go somewhere that is not your house, then you should wear a mask. I personally do not see the difference between a large gathering during the holidays and going to school with hundreds of other kids. I don't think there really is a difference between the two. I know that people are tired of wearing masks. I am too. 
But fatigue is no reason to turn our backs on the truth, which is that we need this mandate because it is one thing that I know will help this end. I know that many parents have specific feelings about this, but the people who are actually in schools and actually have to follow these guidelines are the teachers and the students. I saw many charts today displaying the feelings that the teachers have, but I wonder what would happen if we asked how the students felt, because you might be surprised on what you find. Thank you. Thank you. We'd say thank you to everybody who came out to speak tonight. I think we all know it takes a lot of courage to get up at the podium, and we appreciate your thoughts, and we are certainly noted them. So thank you again. Um, we'll move on to item four, discussion and possible action. Um, the proposed suspension of policy 5141.8 face masks uh, slash coverings effective Monday, February 28, 2022. And as noted before, this is the policy that we had um, voted upon uh, during the pandemic, it goes hand in hand with the governor's uh, mandate and the policy surrounding that. Um, so sunsetting this policy would be our next step moving forward um, as that policy also sunsets. So I will entertain a motion to suspend policy 5141.8, effective Monday, February 28th, 2022. I would make that motion. Second. Uh, Henry, thank you. Second by Mrs. Wilty. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've heard a lot this evening. Um, if anybody wants, put your mask down, take a breath. You all need fresh air. It sucks around this thing. I'm in the construction business now. Um, I know we have to do this a little. Um, you know, I think we've heard a lot of comments um, about the mask. Again, you know, Stratford, I think, has been one of the more restrictive towns. Um, I know people in the East Asian School District who never went remote, and their, uh, their positivity rates were no better or worse than ours. I appreciate the, the concerns that the staff has, but I think the social and emotional effects on these kids is significant, especially our younger kids. And I, and I think it's time. I think the rates are going down. You know, everybody responds differently to COVID. If, if this if the rate gets worse, if things get worse, we have to build it. And we call this meeting with the 24-hour notice. I apologize for that. I didn't call this meeting. But it kept a lot of the public from coming out and speaking. I'm kind of glad that we called 24-hour notice because I know we'd have like 1,000 people in the room speaking <laughs> against it. But um, you know, I think in, in the future, hopefully, we will do a little better job of noticing these meetings, both for your sake, so if we actually do want public participation, um, we'll get it, and just out of courtesy of the members, so we can plan for it. But, but because of all those reasons, I, I think it's time. I think we can look at a, a different policy, a change policy. Um, I'm 100% I'm in favor of match choice. <laughs> possibly rewriting this policy to incorporate a match choice, giving us the ability that if the if and, and again, we've, we've been through flu, we've been through a million, the SARS, the bird, the swine, we've had them all, and we've survived, and we did it without masks. Um, but if it does come to a point where kids and teachers are getting significantly ill from a, from a re-variation of this, then, then yeah, we have the ability to do that. But I think we can write a policy that says it. I think we can write a policy that says uh, mass choice, I go to church, our church has been open all throughout the whole thing. It's a mass choice church, and the pews are full every week. So it works. It works. So uh, again, that's that's my reasoning for it, and, and I would be in favor of rewriting the policy at a future date that would include mass choice and giving uh, the administration the ability to re-implement a mass. Anybody else? Ms. Kubit? Something that uh, I was thinking about as the families were speaking, and it's just something for consideration as we're moving forward. Um, some comments, you know, mentioned that children need to see their teacher's mouth move. And I'm just wondering how we're going to address that. We saw the survey, the teachers were split. If there's a teacher who wants to wear a mask because they're more comfortable, but there are families who 
feel their child should see that teacher's face. How are we going to handle that situation? We don't have to answer it now, but it's something to think about because on one hand, you know, we're saying make this a choice or not, and the teachers also want their choice, but the student want their choice. How are we going to address both? That's it. Thank you. Was that a comment or It was it? just something to think about that I was thinking about as I hear the families speak. I'm, you know, I understand where they're coming from, and it stood out to me a few people mentioned that, so. Absolutely. Yeah. From my perspective as the superintendent, um, I'm glad you brought that up. It's key is, is that piece that our staff will have choice as well in this, and that can potentially comfort with that. So I do feel there's a critical piece of information that we probably still need to wait to hear on, and that's the DPH, as well as our local health um, department, before the decision is, is rolled out, okay? Um, we've heard some powerful stories from our families. We have the data, but I think it would be slightly premature when we have time prior to 28 without hearing from those experts and then releasing our decision. Um, the mass policy does make sense for discussion and consideration for a temporary reset if we do uh, end up moving in the direction where we offer last choice. This evening, for me, was powerful, and I sat back and listened to the stories. Our kids have certainly been through a lot. Yeah. So as we continue to unpack this and uh, make sense of what is going to be in the best interest of Stratford Public Schools, all of them, um, we'll definitely factor that into our Any further discussion? We are voting to suspend policy 5141.8 effective Monday, February 28, 2022. Okay. Further action to come pending uh, information from the DPH, um, but suspending it now, like effective 28th now, uh, I'm sorry, effective February 28th, voting on that now because our meeting would be on February 28th, so we don't want to push it, the suspension of the policy out the Okay? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Wilty. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Ms. Bedell. Yes. Mr. Henner. Yes. And chair votes yet? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Seeing no further business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn.